Good morning, friends. It is good to be with you in worship this morning. And I'm thankful that we have the ability to share in worship online because that is the only way that Robin and John Allen and I can share in worship with you today. We have all tested positive for COVID and we are quarantining per CDC guidelines. We hope that all of you are feeling well. And I want to share a few things with you this morning before we begin our time of worship. First, our elders will meet today at 11.30 on Zoom, and an email with the link to that meeting has already been sent out. So elders, please check your email so that you can join the 11.30 meeting. Second, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's the start of the Lenten season. Our sanctuary will be open on Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the imposition of ashes, and we hope that you will find time to stop by and mark the beginning of Lent. Lastly, we look forward to being back in the sanctuary on next Sunday as we begin our Lenten sermon series, Pathways of Faith, What God Wants for You. We hope you will all join us then. Again, even in times when we cannot physically be together for worship, we know that we are together in the Spirit of God that sustains us. So let us come together this morning and worship. Love is hugs, a pick-me-up, family. Love is sharing the last piece of pizza, or giving away your last Rolo. Love is hard to explain. A roller coaster, a heartbeat, a smile. Love is being known, eternal, a circle of friends. Love is knowing God. Every morning brings new challenges. An earthquake, a war, fires burning, floodwaters rising up and up. And so we pray every morning without ceasing. We lift up people in places who are suffering and we hold them in our hearts. But we do not stop there. We put our prayers into action through Week of Compassion one blossom of love and justice and mercy at a time. For God's mercies are also new every morning. God's favor is not exhausted, nor has God's compassion ever failed. Week of Compassion is the Relief, Refugee, and Development Mission Fund of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. Week of Compassion transforms suffering into hope. Ashes of despair into blossoms of new and abundant life. Morning after morning. For over 75 years, 
Week of Compassion has been working with local partners all over the world to respond to disasters when they occur and to do the slow, beautiful work of ongoing development, strengthening communities one neighborhood, one family, one child of God at a time. Because of your generosity, women are learning to become beekeepers in Haiti, churches in Tornado Alley are rebuilding, Afghan refugees are being resettled, and Ukrainian families are finding long-term support. When the shadows fall, we lift our hearts in prayer, and then we rise up anew and get to work. We put our prayers into action. A vibrant rainbow of hope for a new future. Spreading the good news that God's mercies really are new every morning. Week of Compassion. Let's pray and act and give and rise up anew together. If you're like me, you wonder how to respond when disaster strikes. How do we make sure that the money we send goes to meet the needs of people affected? Week of Compassion is that place for me. I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that 100% of the funds donated are put into on-the-ground efforts to help people who are desperately in need. So I encourage you to give. Mark Week of Compassion on the four line of your check, or if you give online, choose Week of Compassion from the drop-down menu, and together, let's make a difference in the world. God of compassion, receive and share these gifts. May they meet people in their moments of how could this happen and accompany them into the days of celebration and restoration. We ask this in the name of the one who teaches us to love. Amen. I've been thinking about God's love. And I've been wondering if there's a way that we can measure just how much God loves us. What do you think? Sometimes we use a measuring cup like this one to measure things. If I was making some cookies, I would use this measuring cup or these measuring spoons to make sure that I put just enough flour or sugar or milk into the recipe. I wonder if we could make, if we could measure God's love like that. What do you think? The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My cup runs over. So if the cup runs over, I don't guess we could use that to measure God's love, could we? If we were building something, we might use a tape measure to measure the length and the width and the height of something. I wonder if we could use this tape measure to measure God's love for us. Scripture tells us that God's love is higher than the highest heaven. I don't think this tape measure will go that far. So maybe the tape measure is not the best thing for us to use to measure God's love. We use a a watch to measure time. I wonder if we could use a watch to measure how long God's love will last. 
the Bible tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. Wow. That's a lot. I don't guess we could measure God's love with a watch. Maybe God's love for us is so great that we can't possibly measure it. But I wonder if you can share it. Do you think you can help me with a project? Do you think you can draw a picture of God's love? Whatever you think God's love looks like. And then can you get one of your grown-ups to take a picture of it and send it to me? They can just send it in an email or they can text it to me. And I'm going to take all of those pictures and I'm going to share them with someone special this week. Someone who might need to remember just how much God loves them. Now, will you join me in a prayer? We'll invite everyone to pray with us. Just repeat after me. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for your love. It's so very big. Help us to share your love always and everywhere. Amen. Lord, because love is patient, help us to be slow to judge, but quick to listen, hesitant to criticize, but eager to encourage remembering your endless patience with us. Because love is kind, help our words to be gentle and our actions to be thoughtful. Remind us that even our small interactions with others are opportunities to reflect your love. Because love does not envy or boast, and it is not proud, help us to have humble hearts that see the good in others. May we celebrate and appreciate all that we have and all that we are. Because love is not rude or self-seeking, help us to speak words that are easy on the ear and on the heart. When we are tempted to get wrapped up in our own little world, remind us there's a great big world out there full of needs and hurts. Because love is not easily angered, and keeps no record of wrongs. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. When we want to hold on to a grudge, gently help us release it so that we can reach out with a hand of love instead. Because love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Help us stand up for what is right and good. May we defend the defenseless and help the helpless. Show us how we can make a difference. Because love always protects and always trusts. Help us to be a refuge for those around us. When the world outside is harsh and cold, may our hearts be a place of acceptance and warmth. Finally, because love always perseveres, Help our hearts continually beat with love for you and for others. Thank you for showing us what the word love really means. Amen. Good morning. Some of you already know that I have a bit of a quirky trait. Well, actually several quirky traits, but the one I want to focus on today is my love of Subaru vehicles. I love everything about Subaru. The cars, the company, the safety record, even the logo is cool. We currently own three Subarus and I've had a total of five over the last 20 years. The best thing about Subaru though, their catchphrase, love, 
It's what makes a Subaru a Subaru. They even have Share the Love events, where they encourage Subaru owners to give to charities, take part in community cleanup events, gather together at outdoor festivals, and, and, and really just embrace the outdoors. You see, the company is fanatical about the quality, safety, and reliability of their cars, a.k.a. the love they put into them. I love Subaru so much, I spent about three years searching for the quirkiest model the company ever produced, the Baja. Now, if you don't know, and I find it sad if you don't, they only produced the Baja from 2003 to 2006, and only about 30,000 were ever made. So when they discontinued it, it became an instant classic. It's this half-car, half-truck-looking thing that most people think is weird-looking, even ugly. But not me. To me, the Baja is sleek and beautiful and just begging to be loved. When we gather around this table to claim and proclaim the love of Christ, to remember Jesus' loving sacrifice made for us, it's a share the love event. Any and everyone is welcome to partake at this table. Everyone is allowed a seat at this table. Everyone is loved at this table. What would it look like for our church family and this community to be associated with the catchphrase, love? It's what makes a Christian a Christian. As we partake of communion today, I want you to think about the things that get in the way of your daily share the love event. The things that keep people from associating you with love. Will you join me in prayer? God, we come to this table today professing your love for us, confessing that we have not loved hard enough in your name, that we have fallen short in sharing your love with those most in need of it. We pray that as we eat and drink, your spirit will overflow us with so much of your love that it flows into every corner of our community. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup, saying, this cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink it, remember me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even if I can speak in all the tongues of the earth, and those of the angels too, but do not have love, I am just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy such that I can comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, or if I have faith great enough to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own to feed those poorer than I, then hand over my body to be burned but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, it does not put on airs, and it is not snobbish. It is never rude or self-seeking. It is not prone to anger, nor does it brood over injuries. Love doesn't rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in the truth. 
There's no limit to love's forbearance, to its trust, its hope, its power to endure. Love never fails. Prophecies will cease. Tongues will be silent. Knowledge will pass away. Our knowledge is imperfect and our prophesying is imperfect. When the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became an adult, I put childish ways aside. Now we see indistinctly as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. My knowledge is imperfect now. Then I will know, even as I am known. There are in the end three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this week I was reminded that the really amazing thing about 1 Corinthians 13 is that even hundreds of thousands of cheesy wedding cards and inspirational posters and bad Christian coffee mugs can't kill it. Paul's hymn to love is perhaps one of the most recognizable texts in the New Testament. And it is unbelievably beautiful. But it has just about nothing to do with romance. Now, to be sure, the subject of love is a, is a tricky one. I, I think because we are so often loved poorly, loved incompletely, loved conditionally. And forgive the pop psychology, but my theory is that when we are loved so poorly, we begin on some level to assume that maybe we're undeserving of being loved well. And from this state of being loved poorly and feeling undeserving and then loving poorly in return, which let's face it, is the foundation of countless self-help empires we do some stuff that's unhelpful. I've been thinking about the things that I've done in my life to try and make myself more lovable. I lost weight, I tried not to use big words. I tried laughing even when the joke wasn't funny. I tried showing the other person only the parts of myself that I thought were lovable. And if there weren't enough of those parts, I just manufactured some to fill in the blanks. Because I was sure that to know me is actually not to love me. We come by this naturally, given the the messages about what is okay and what's not. Strong, smart girls learn to act ditzy and helpless. Tender-hearted boys learn to toughen up. And it's no secret that some of, of these messages insisting on our fragmentation came from the church. I remember a, a male Sunday school teacher 
when Callan was in about the fifth grade, taking me aside and suggesting that I insist she stop answering all the questions in Sunday school so quickly, because then the, the boys don't really get a chance. And how it was unfair because I must be giving Callan the answers. Far too often, we're told in a variety of ways that it's not okay to actually be who we are. Richard Rohr has a way of assessing our spiritual health. Namely, what do we do with pain? Do we transmit it or do we transform it? Because the mirror in which we might see ourselves as God sees us gets dimmer and dimmer when the pain of being human is transmitted to us. When the messages we hear tear us down and diminish us. When the people who should love us most can't or don't. When the world around us reminds us all of the ways we don't measure up, that pain becomes embedded. And our own sin and brokenness begin to be a lens through which we view ourselves and others. And then the, the pain of not knowing who we really are it's transmitted through all of the things that Paul describes, arrogance and impatience, unkindness, envy, selfishness. It can be a desperate cycle based on something as simple as the truth my mother spoke once. Honey, <laughs> bullies just bully out of their own hurt inside as though they have to spread it. This is true of so many different places in our society, right? It's a truth so prevalent in our world of division and discord today when it seems the go-to is to strike first. And I think what Paul was saying to his Corinthian church plant gone bad was stop hurting each other. Okay, so let's unpack this just a little bit. This letter to the church in Corinth wasn't providing a sentimental reading for their weddings. It was a smackdown. They were bickering and dysfunctional and competitive. Some of them had some mad skills. They were being jerks about it, as though being church together had become some kind of competitive sport. They were being petty and prideful and ridiculous. They didn't know who they were. And Paul was trying to remind them. And he told them who they were, not by telling them about history or biology or sociology, but by telling them about love. Not the emotion of love, not the sentiment of love, not the romance of love. Because honestly, I have yet to see a Hallmark card with the, I love you so much that I will endure you. Or my love for you bears all your things. That might make a good Hallmark card, but I haven't seen it yet. Paul writes of love as origin, love as source, love as God, and God as love. This love really has nothing to do with feeling nice. It's actually not about feelings at all. It's about truth. It's about the truth of who we are through the eyes of a God who knows us fully. This love described by Paul isn't mushy or sentimental. It's tough and unwilling to yield. This love, which is patient and kind and isn't rude or boastful and is self-giving and all of that, 
Here's what's scary about this kind of love. You can't manipulate it. There's no amount of weight loss, piety, personal management, big smiles, strained pretense. None of that can affect this love. And maybe in the absence of manipulation, we stand before the eyes of God. This love is found in the gaze of God. As God looks upon us naked and whole. Because this type of love is characterized by the giver, not the receiver. Gone are the strivings and manipulations and efforts to make ourselves more lovable. In the face-to-face gaze of the beloved, we are known because we are loved. We aren't loved because we are known. That leads us to trying to gussy ourselves up to be lovable. At the very end of this chapter, Paul names three things which are of central value to the church. Faith, hope, and love. We've been talking about them for the last few weeks. These three form a a brief summary, if you will, about what it means to live as church. Three things which are central to a, a value to the church. Faith, hope, and love. Faith will one day become sight and hope will end in fulfillment. Love will still remain. Love will still remain because God's love is and will always be. We are drawn into that love of God and we are remade by that love. We are known by God because we are loved by God. Think about that. The truth of who we were before any pain and hurt was transmitted to us by those who are hurt and in pain. Before we forget, before we forgot, we were loved. Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. For now, maybe we manipulate ourselves and our image and our loved ones and we see only dimly. dimly. What does it mean for us to gaze in the mirror and see what God sees? The truth of who you are is found in the eyes of God, not the eyes of the world. It's the love of God who created this world and called it good. It's the love of a God who brought the Israelites out of slavery, who fed Ruth and Naomi, who walked among us as Jesus of Nazareth. It is the love of the God who knit you together in your mother's womb that gets to tell you who you are. Nothing else. Not the media, not a family who wishes you were different, and not even yourself. Only the God who knows and loves you fully can tell you who you are. And this is true for every single one of us. But here's the hard part. Paul never says that, the, that, that such a love feels good. We often act as though the, the mission of the church is to gather like, like-minded and likable people together. We think that in such a community it will be easy for us to love or more honestly, easier to feel the love. But true love is not measured in how good it makes us feel. In the movie Dead Men Walking, Sister Helen Pregen offers pastoral care to a despicable murderer. He was unrepentant, wretched. Yet her faith in a loving God allowed her moments before his execution, to say to him, 
I want the last face you see in this world to be the face of love. So you look at me when they do this thing. I'll be the face of love for you. I can't help but think that Paul might be telling us to be the face of love for each other. When we know we are loved by God in the fullness of God's knowledge of us, we are free to live in this love, free to transmit the love of Christ in a hurting world, free to see ourselves and others as God sees us, not because we are good, but because we are loved. And seeing just a glimpse, wanting it, moving toward it, brings us closer to the love of God. And that's the whole point.
May you have the faith to live boldly. May you discover a hope that sustains you. May you know how deeply and fiercely God loves you. And may you carry that into the world as you seek to be the face of love here in this place. Amen.